Hey guys, in this video we're going to be talking about the monlickers. I almost said manlicker there. I wanted to say it. I want to say it because everybody is everybody sort of says it a little bit differently. <laughs> um, so in this video we're going to cover the, uh, the the mostly the M95. So this is going to be a M95 sort of video that we're going to direct people to with their frequently yeah. asked questions. I got a lot of questions. Um, yeah. I'm Aaron, by the way. Hey, yeah, this is Aaron. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you guys have probably recognized his voice from the podcast. If you yep. haven't listened to the podcast, listen to the podcast. Um, but yeah, this is this is Aaron, gun hipster, Do eight millimeter hipster, eight millimeter hipster, man okay. liquor lover, man liquor lover. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about uh, M95s here. We have a we have a, a few on the table. Um, sort of cover some of the the different variants, the stuff that you're going to run into. So this is stuff yeah, for overall like markings and, and a lot of the frequently asked questions I get. Yeah, yeah. So this will be something helpful for if you are shopping from 95s. Maybe you're curious about them, or you know, if you want a video to help sort of teach you what the different markings are. So when you're at a gun show and you find one for sale, that way you can see what it is because. Yeah. You know, a lot of this stuff is pretty, pretty unknown. Like a lot of people don't quite understand what they see, you know, when they, when they pick up Unfortunately, the only really good books about markings are in German. Yeah. And, and they're not translated into English yet. So. Yeah. So, uh, so maybe one day, maybe one day somebody will translate those, but maybe once, you know, the guns sort of pick up and become, become more popular to, uh, to, uh, to collect. But so to start off, um, here is the granddaddy. Yeah. <laughs> is this in, is this in frame? No, I don't think you can get the whole thing in frame. <laughs> yeah. So this is a uh, this is an 1886 here. So this is the uh, the Monlicker that really started it off. So this is Ferdinand's first rifle or his first straight pull rifle or at least his first successful straight pull rifle. You know a lot more about. Yeah. So Ferdinand. this was this was his first uh, accepted design by the Austro-Hungarian Army. Um, it's an 11 millimeter uh, Verndel. Uh, which was their caliber they used for their Verndal rifles, the single shot rifles, and uh, uses an M-block clip. It's um, straight pull action, just like the other Monlicker styles. But uh, the difference is this is a falling block action versus a, a turn bolt action. So uh, there's no bolt head. It's just a just a round end at the piece of the end, and it's a falling block action. So not suitable for uh, switch to the smokeless powder. Uh, they switched to a different style for the 1888s and the 1890s. Yeah, so I guess it couldn't accept the higher pressures of the smokeless, but uh, but it's, it's really nice because, you know, a lot of the problems with straight pull rifles is that they do have this, you know, they have this, you know, this rotation that has to be worked into the straight pull action. So mm -hmm. it tends to, whenever you work, you know, Schmidt Rubens or, you know, M95, stuff like that, you can kind of feel that resistance whenever you work them, but with this guy, you don't have that extra bit of resistance because that falling block is just kind of, it just sort of happens like underneath the bolt. Like yeah. it's, it's a different feel to it. It's a completely different feel. This feels like there's nothing going on. And, yeah. and, and really, there really isn't anything happening except gravity. There's gravity. There's not even a spring in there. It's just, well, there is, there is a small spring, but it's not even really heavy tension. It's just gravity that basically keeps the block in place, yeah. which is why putting extra pressure on is not a great idea. Yeah. There's also notice there's no fail safes for if this bolt were to, to come loose, it goes right back into your face. There's yeah. no, there's no lugs, there's no nothing. So. Yeah. So, uh, so this gun, obviously like the name, it's an 1886. It was pretty revolutionary for its time, you know, because it, you know, it had the, uh, the five round, you know, in block clip. So you could load all five rounds really fast. I'd argue it was, it's the most advanced black powder big bore rifle. The Kirkpatrick was probably the last one accepted, but that's a tube magazine. Yeah. And that's, yeah. A, that's a big problem. You get balance issues, you get long load times. Mm -hmm. This is a fast, easy to load, five shot magazine with an in block clip. I, I would argue this is probably the most advanced of the big bore uh, smokeless or yeah. black powder rifles. I, I think I would agree because it's. Because so the big competitors in 1886, of course, is the Bell, right? And everybody like that's the winner because of smokeless, just yeah. by default because the of round. smokeless. Yeah, because of the cartridge, like uh, the rifle, sort of standing on its own merit. It's basically a you know modified Kropatschek. So you have the 1886 Kropatschek, and then you have the 1886 you know Lebel, 
And those are the two big competitors. And those are all, those are tube, one round, you know, one load one round at a time type of reload where this, it's a nice, you know, fast packet reloaded magazine. It's um, this, this, I would say without the advent of smokeless powder, this would have been a, a, almost as world changing. I would, I would argue as, as LaBelle was at the same time. Yeah. I, I think I, yeah. Cause yeah. Imagine smokeless I mean, powder I didn't mean, happen. Germany had single shot rifles. Uh, Russia, yeah. w- uh, Russia was using single shot. Everybody's using single shot big boy rifles. Some of them had magazines, uh, the 18, the 7184s. Yeah, the 74, yeah. They were tube magazine, though. Yeah, so it's so sort everybody's of had a, tube magazines. Yeah, like Kropacek style magazines, uh, except the Swiss. They're the oddballs with the, with the veteran. It is a tube magazine, but it's the whole Kingsgate loading system. It is um, different, yes. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's unique enough that, I mean, Italy copied this. The French even ended up copying this design. The Germans did with the 1888, with, the, with the, all the Mbok designs come off of Monlicker. That's, yeah. That was his idea. Which is when you, when you sit down and you think about every single country that's adopted a rifle that uses the, the Monlicker magazine, it's, it's really a lot. Quite a lot of you know, countries adopted them, and this is the rifle that started them all. So just to give you a little bit of backstory onto, uh, on M95s, in case you're not familiar, before we jump into them. So we're gonna be skipping a couple models coming from the 1886 to the, to the M95. Not too many. They didn't, they didn't do very many. It was the 1886 to the 1888, which is the exact same gun, except it was in smokeless. And then the 1890, or the 8890, and then the 1890, which was a short rifle. Uh, there's not very many of those. And then the 1895. They basically just very rapidly advanced into, into this. By the time, actually, the 8x50R came around, it was actually semi-smokeless. It wasn't completely smokeless to start out with. Hmm which is why it was 8x52R, then it became 8x50R semi-smokeless, and then it became fully smokeless later on. Oh, so it's, yeah. it's kind of a weird transition, but they, they, they rushed. Everybody was rushing. It was, it was a mad dash to see who could come up with the next best thing because smokeless just destroyed everything. Yeah, so this is the first one that they came out with, right? The long rifle, the M95 yeah. long rifle. So yeah, it's another one of those guns where it's, it's kind of hard to fit on full frame. frame there. It is yeah. it is very long. Do you know the barrel length of this guy? It's got to be like 900 millimeters, something like it's that. Something it's something like long. that. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, unfortunately. I mean, I put the the 1886 down beside me, and it was a little bit further up, but it's not much shorter. Yeah, yeah. You're six six foot. I'm six two, and, and that's how far it goes up. So it's a really yeah. it's a long gun, but not super heavy. I would say that that 1886 is much much heavier than this is. Mostly because I believe that one was more to do with being a club weapon as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it's got a it's got quite a heft to it. Yeah, you said when you had the stock off of it, it felt just like a baseball bat. Yeah, a... like you could definitely feel like it was it was just solid, solid. Now, as far as collecting goes, if you're gonna if you're gonna you know run into M95s out there, the the long rifles are the least common that you're gonna correct gonna run into. Now that is because of well World War One to begin with huge meat grinder, huge loss of men and, and arms and everything like that. So a lot of them didn't make it. And then the rework program was started by Austria in 1930, which is where you get M95 slash 30. And then Bulgaria instituted their own rework program in 1934, which is where you get M95 slash 34. So that rework program involved cutting them down to short rifle length and rebarreling and redoing the stocks and everything like that. So they Long rifles didn't really weren't needed because everybody wanted short rifles. So they they were very few and far between left. A lot of them are not in great condition because most of them that are original M95s are captures or war, war reparation rifles, excuse me, and they're not in great shape. This one is in great shape because it ended up going to Bulgaria. Bulgaria did keep quite a few uh, long rifles in uh, 8 by 56 r they did change them, but they left them in the racial long rifle condition for guard duty and stuff like that. Um, it was just easier. They had a lot of extra parts. Yeah, so you have a lot of lossage, like you said, and then, yeah, they had a pretty extensive program to convert the long rifles to short rifles, and we'll get over that, uh, we'll go over that in a bit. We'll show some, like, I guess, purpose-built carbines that have been transitioned to 8 by 56 and then we'll go over some long rifle to, to carbine conversions as well. But Pretty much, if you're going to be looking for the most collectible gun, you're going to want to look for the long rifle. Mm-hmm. That's everyone, you know, asks. I think if you have an M95, do you have a do you have a long rifle? Because that's 
First question is, is it 8x50R? Because that's going to be the most difficult to find because the program was so extensive, it it's switching them. So it was twofold. Shorting them to uh, short rifle length and then switching them to 8x56R, which was the more powerful cartridge. Yeah. So the the most of them that you'll find, it like this one here, is going to be 8x56R. So finding them in 8x50R is important. Original uh, long rifles or uh, short rifles as well. Or the... Um, the next question is, is if it's a long rifle. Yeah. And it's it's one of those interesting things with, with the M95s is that the 8x50 is the more value. If it's still in its original you know, 8x50 caliber, it tends to be a lot more, uh, to go for a lot more money. Mm, yeah. Which it's is about, It's usually about double the premium. Yeah, which is kind of interesting because it's, it's, the only way you're going to shoot it is if you reload for it. Nobody makes it. So if you want a shooter, like for me, if I was going to get a, an M95 long rifle, I think I would look for one that was converted to 56R. It's less like collectible. It's not like World War I correct, but it's a better shooter. So it just kind of mm -hmm. depends mm -hmm. on like what you're going after whenever you, whenever you get an M95. If you're going after the, you know, the historical like World War I significance or if you just kind of want the shooter, the, going after the shooting experience. So... Have you reloaded uh, 50, 8 No, 50? not 8 by 50 I don't have anything in 8 by 50 unfortunately. But can I... you convert the 8 by 56 cases? Yes. You can convert okay. 8 by 56 R cases, and you can convert 8 uh, 762 uh, 54 R cases, actually. That'd be cool. Um, it's actually not super difficult to make 8 by 50 R. The difficulty is going to be the fact that you have to do conversions, and then also the dies are not super cheap. They're not well, well made by a lot of places anymore. I guess we can move on to... The yeah, short rifles. Yeah, how about the? Is this? Yeah, this is a long rifle, right? That was shortened. So yes. What is this one called? Well, uh, they don't have separate names. They don't. <laughs> All right. So the ones that were shortened from long rifles to carbines, they have a separate name, which I, I thought they did. Is it? Because you mentioned the M ninety five thirty and then the M ninety five thirty four. Yes. So that depends on who did the conversion. Okay. So the M ninety five thirty is Austria. The M ninety five thirty four is Bulgarian. Okay. So you can tell who did the conversion. Um, this is uh, Aust uh, Bulgarian by the font of the S uh, and where they place it typically as well. So obviously it's going to be difficult to see on here, but typically for the S stamp, which signifies conversion to eight by fifty six R, Bulgaria tends to stamp it right on top of the other stamps. They didn't care. It wasn't their responsibility. It was a previous. Previous empire, nobody gives a crap. So they would stamp it right over the top. Austria tended to stamp it further up the shank, so you could still see the markings, because they also, that's where they would put their acceptance marks. Um, they, the font is slightly different, too. Like you can see the S on that one, Danny. Mm -hmm. You see it has like a more fancy script to it. And I believe this one, yeah. You can see this one is a very plain and simple S. And you see it's further up the shank. And we'll show pictures of this so you guys can mm -hmm. see it. But it's a very plain and simple S. And I, I call the Bulgarian one the fancy S. This is the simple S. This is Austrian. Okay. Now, I don't have an example of it, but Hungary did conversions too. And theirs was very easy to tell because it has a big H. I don't have an example of it, unfortunately, because Hungary only did it for two years. And then they switched to the one that you had for a little while. Oh, yeah, yeah, the 35M, right? Yes. Yep. So they didn't do it for very long. Uh, before they switched from reworking these to just building a whole new rifle. So they're very hard to find, but if you find one with an H stamp, it means the same thing as the S, but it was done by Hungary instead of Austria or Bulgaria. Neat. So is that pretty much the only marking that they put on them when they converted them to 56? Or? Yes, typically. Um, Bulgaria has some other hallmarks that are indicative that, um, of their style, which is they would stamp the bolts or do electro pencil on the bolts matching serials to the receiver and the barrel. They would also restamp stocks a lot. Uh, the original stock stamp is on the right side of the gun. If you're looking down the barrel, it's the right, the left side of the gun, sorry. And on the Bulgarian, they would put on the right side. It's just the way it is. If there's multiple serials, which tends to be indicative of a Bulgarian rework, that's also another sign. And then they would, for some reason, I don't know why, they would two-digit stamp the front band to match the receiver. I don't I don't know why they would do that, but they did. But as a weird, weird thing to bring up another common question of um, M95s that I get a lot is what the markings are, the standard markings, and they're pretty easy. Uh, so standard markings, 
Receiver serial is going to be right here. Barrel serial right here. There would be a two-digit code matching these two serials here on the top handguard. And then stock serial right here on the, right, on the left side of the stock on the butt. There are no serials on the bolt originally. Hand-fitted bolts, but no serials. Danny, has that a good idea? <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. What could go wrong? So that's how you know that if it's an original bolt, Bulgaria is very, very, very good about stamping and inscribing on these bolts. So if it's an original bolt, it's not stamped at all. So, so it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, I always get a little chuckle when I see ads for matching M95s because there's no way to know. Yeah, I was just thinking that you could, you could think if you had, say, an original uh, M95 N8x50R, and you think that that's the original bolt for the gun, like that's the bolt that was hand fitted to the gun, therefore that's what a good you know, bolt fitting, like Othias I think kind of made this phrase popular is that the originals with the fitted bolts are, you know, work exceptionally well. They do, they work a lot better. But it's not numbered, so you don't know if you, that bolt which was originally switched out for a number bolt that wasn't matching. And I can tell you that a lot of the stuff that I have has been reworked so many times just from, just from World War I, uh, that it's very hard to believe anything being reworked, um, not reworked. Yeah, you could just imagine a group of soldiers, you know, disassembling their guns and, you know, swapping bolts or something accidentally or, you know. Or just getting a pile back at the armorers and they just need to get something working. Yeah, so if, it's, if it's not numbered, there's no way to tell if that bolt is original of the gun, which kind of makes it hard to tell what, like, an original M95 is supposed to feel like, right? It's pretty much impossible. There's yeah. no way to know for sure without going back in time, 100%. You can get a good idea, the, the accounts of it being very smooth and that kind of thing. And Othias' video is a good example of this, where one, it's, it's a good chance that it's maybe the original bolt, but there's just no way to know for 100%. Yeah. And these seem to be hit or miss. Like you could, uh, you know, we have quite a few examples here. And it seems like if you pick one of these up and you work the action of it, it's going to be pretty stiff or it could be real smooth. It's just, it's like luck of the draw. Well, the, the key thing that I like to tell people when they first get one is um, it's not, because there's the, the extraction issue that we talked about, it's not meant to be babied. You don't need to worry about it. It will respond if you go hard at it. And I always recommend people, like if you're like, if you kind of, see, it sticks. So if, you, if you're not going to do it, it's a military rifle. It's meant to be abused. It'll do it if you pull it hard enough. But I think that's a key thing too, is that people are used to turn bolts and being able to get the extraction process yeah. on the bolt up and then pulling back is not that big of a deal. But with this, you're doing it all in one motion. So you really have to kind of yank on it sometimes to get it to go. And people don't want to do that. They're afraid. It's yeah. totally different. If you've only ever shot a turn bolt, this is completely different than yeah. whatever you've done before. Yeah, it is. It's it's a it's a unique feeling if you've never like shot or, or worked a worked a. Oh, and the other thing that I've noticed too, and I had this with Sam in my video that I did for your channel, is um, turn bolt shooters tend to push laterally, so you're pushing mm. horizontally, and it binds it all the way down. This is meant to go straight back and forth. I. I do think it has a poor reputation for a good reason. I think a lot of them were put together out of barrels like the Russian K98s. But I think a lot of it also has to do with just it's not very common for people to shoot these often. A lot of people that I was, uh, the common phrase I get is it kicks like a mule. I don't think it's that bad. I think you can get used to anything. And I think that's a big turnoff for a lot of people to shoot it often. So they, do it a couple times, it's mushy, it's, it's hard to do, the recoil sucks, you're just like, I don't wanna deal with this thing, so it becomes a bad reputation. I think that's most of what the issue is. A good part of it, though, is also gonna be the fact that they just pull stuff out of barrels. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So I have an M9530, and so it's, it's a you know, completely reworked gun. And when I, before I bought it, you know, I picked it up and I worked the bolt, and I was pretty, I was pretty impressed on like, how smooth it is. Like it's not quite as good as like a K31, mm. but it's it's better than my uh, my. I have a Swiss 1893 uh, Monlicker, and that gun's a, it's a it's a matching gun. So the bolt was actually you know hand fitted, <laughs> matched mm -hmm. in Switzerland to this to this you know this Monlicker rifle, 
And I'm pretty sure my, my M9530 is smoother than the Swiss made 1893. So it's, it's really interesting. I don't, I don't know if that has to do with the, the bolt, the, you know, the, the bolt mechanics of, of the two over the, over I'm the not years. Sure. But, uh, but just, you know, you want to pick up the gun and work the action. So like if you're at a gun show, you want to cut the tie and, and work the bolt and see if it's a, see if it has a good feel to it. See, um, you know, if you, if you like it, if it's terrible, you probably want to pass on it, but there is a chance that it's good. So just because it's a reworked gun doesn't mean that it's going to be terrible. Um, it's just going to be something that you're going to have to, to play with. And, and kind of like what you said, a lot of times, first time Milserp shooters, I always give them the advice of work, work the action hard. Like don't baby it, you know, put effort, you just put the, you know, put the muscle into it, put the effort into it. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people tend to treat like mill serps like they're delicate, and they're really not. They're they're meant to be you know used used hard and fast, and that's and that's sort of where the uh, where the M95 performs best. Now I did say that they never numbered the bolts. There's always an exception to the rule. Always, yeah. Somebody was going to call it out. Do you want to hand me that one right on top over there? So this one right here is, and we'll get a close up of this too. This is a Bulgarian contract M95. So now Bulgaria bought M95 specially uh, from Steyr and eventually Budapest because Steyr was busy trying to arm other countries uh, with Mausers actually. Um, and they got behind, so Budapest made some too. Now this breaks a lot of the rules of M95s. It has a crest, it has a numbered bolt, which this one does not, so this is a not, not matching bolt. It has a vent hole in the bolt, which this one does not, so once again, this one has been replaced. And on the side, instead of it saying where it was made on top, it says it on the side rail, which this one says Steyr 1903. Now, a lot of people ask me, when was my M95 made? I can't tell you, except for Bulgarians, because the Bulgarian contract ones, they dated them when they were made. All the other M95s, serial numbers were reused every fiscal year, so serial numbers are useless. Acceptance dates, which are on the, the barrels, are only when they were accepted into service. Now, during World War I, it's pretty common to think that if it was accepted in 1917, it probably went into use in 1917 and was made in 1917 because of the vast turnover rate. Yeah. So, but if it's made, if it was accepted pre, don't know. What I can say though, is that every single M95 receiver, with another exception, which we'll get to in a second, was made prior to 1918. So Steyr and Budapest made so many M95 receivers that Bulgaria never needed to make anymore. Hmm. So it's kind of like the, uh, with the, the fins with the Mosin. They just, the, the, the Russians made a pile of them. They never really needed to, to buy any more Correct. receivers because they just there's a lot left over. Right. So that's why Bulgaria used these into the 1970s even in very small numbers. But you'll run into ones from Bulgaria that are kind of beat to crap. And that's ones that went that far. And that's an interesting point to me is that like a lot of people try to go, oh, serial numbers because they're thinking of Mauser. Austria-Hungary didn't do that. Um, the letter codes at the end, once again, another Mauser thing or another, another rifle company yeah. manufacturer thing, they reused them. It's just weird. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> they only ever had a four-digit uh, number code, which was 1111 with the letter code at the end, A through Z. And then it would restart. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so it's, it's, it didn't seem to be a very big deal, I guess, keeping track of the serial numbers if, if there's a lot of duplicate guns with duplicate. So you could have a 1234A, and there's going to be multiple 1234As of that gun. So it's, it's almost like a why bother if you're... I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, can't, I can't tell you the explanation for that. Yeah. Now, very rarely you will find them, though, and I do have one example, and we'll get a picture of it. Now, they did separate them because they would put unit designations on the butt plates. Right on the top of the tang here, they would put a designation. So it would be the company it was assigned to and the number of rifle it was. So that's how they would separate them. Hmm. But once again, those went through so many reworks, so it's hard to find. It's yeah. kind of like finding the, the card in the back of a K31. <laughs> it's kind yeah, of a yeah. neat thing, but it's also like... Ugh. Yeah, Yeah, so that'd be something else to look for with your gun. A lot of people might fixate on the receiver, but you'll want to definitely uh, take a look at the top of the, the, the butt plate just to see if there's any markings there. Oh, and, uh, and as Danny pointed out, you can 
on the other one, you see how small this rear sight is? This is an original short rifle or carbine sight. Yeah, yeah. We put a... So here is, here's the long rifle. And then here is, so this is a carbine made from a long rifle. And that's the long rifle. So you can see how it goes big, small, big. And that's because uh, these share the this same... This barrel would have been a long rifle. Yeah, yeah, originally. And then they would have cut it down. And now another key thing too, and part of the rework process was adding in this thing, which you hate. Yeah. Danny hates this. If you look on the, the long rifle, Danny, what do you see? Uh, it's underslung. It's not As there. A, yeah. This weird looking bolt cross piece is there, isn't there. That's part of the rework process. So if it doesn't get reworked, it doesn't have that. They didn't do it on the long rifles for some reason in Bulgaria because I guess they didn't need to. Underslung makes more sense in this case. But if you're not sure if it's been reworked or not, that's a big key sign yeah. right there. Yeah. So at the very least, the stock, it's a, it's a reworked stock. You know, maybe somebody dropped another action. Well, I do stock. have an example here. Yes, this one here. This is an example of a Bulgarian rework. It has the, the stock tang or the, the sling point back here. This is not marked. There's no S mark. It's 8 by 56. I thought it was 8 by 50. <laughs> so how did you find out? How do you, how do you find out? I loaded an 8x56R cartridge in it, Danny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you put a 56 and it fits, then it's an 8x56. But if you put an 8x56 in there, and it doesn't you go to fit. work the bolt. And if, it, if the bolt does not fully close, if it does not just fully engage, then it's 8x50. It will not fit. Okay. So, so that's how you know. So you, it's possible that you can run into a 56R gun that doesn't have an S stamp. So that's, that's sort of the rule that a lot of people use is that if it has an S stamp that it's upgraded, and if it doesn't, it's a 50, 50 R gun. There is an exception to every rule, and this gun is a, an obvious exception it's to that. A strange, so. It's a strange piece, but I'm glad to have it. Yeah, it's, it's like, why? Well, later on, as I said, they, they used yeah. them into the 70s. They got sloppy yeah. with the stamps. They started to not really care about stamping them. Yeah. This one has a very faint stamp of the serial on the stock. You can barely see it. Um, they, they did stamp the bolt, um, but like they just, they just stopped caring. Yeah. I don't know if we ever held up the long rifle to the short rifle to compare the links. Did we? To. Well, we can. Short. So just... For size reference, let me see if I can get that in frame real well. There we go. Yeah. So it's, for size reference, that's a long rifle. Oh boy, this oh, is this, this is gonna be, be awkward. Yeah, this is. There we go. <laughs> All right, size reference, long rifle on top, obviously, and then this is a uh, this is a carbine that's converted. Uh, or, uh, yeah. So it's a. <laughs> well, they had carbines and Stutzens, right? Yes. And the same were barrel for, length for the artillery, and the carbines were for our cavalry. Now, how do but you? Eventually, it, it didn't matter. But how do you tell whether or not your gun is a, was originally a Stutzen or a carbine? You can't. Uh, there was a program in the early 1900s to switch all the carbines to Stutzens. Original carbines are very, very difficult to find. Um, the only difference was this piece right here. Stacking yes. rod. Stacking rod. The stacking rod and bayonet lug. The originals carbines had a different front... Um, what is that called? Uh, barrel band? Yeah, different front barrel band where the screw actually went in from this side, not from the left. All the other ones go in from the left, and that's the only way you can tell. Yep. And they're very, 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 very rare because the program started before World War I to swap them all to uh, Stutzen style because the, the cavalry decided they wanted a bayonet and the lug and the stacking lug, stacking rod. So it was, it's very difficult to find one. So it seems like there's a lot of like rules, but then also exceptions to all these rules. Yes. So these, these seem, it seems like a pretty tricky gun to collect, right? It's fun because there's so yeah. many different variations of the same exact thing. Like even for example, um, we can hold up these two examples again. So hold up this one versus this one. Where you see where the bands are, they're in different spots. I don't know why but the stocks are, 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 are made that way. So the bands are actually in different locations. And these are both purpose-built carbines because they have the smaller carbine sight or Stutzen sight. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows why they did it? This is the Bulgarian one. That's a different one entirely. That one did go to Bulgaria, but who knows? 
Now, there is two more exceptions that I have that are very, um, very hard to find. The, this one is one of them. Now, I told you that all M95 receivers were made before 1918. It's kind of true. Czechoslovakia made about 5,000 in the early 20s. This is an example of one. And the only reason you can tell is that it has the standard BRNO mm -hmm. uh, marking that you would see normally on a VZ, VZ rifle. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty interesting seeing it on this because I'm used to seeing it on Mausers. But it's the same, you know, Berno factory marking mm -hmm. on a Mauser, but it's on that M95. Yeah. Now, most of the time you'll find these, they've been changed to 8x56R. Czechoslovakia used them in the original caliber. But they also sold almost all of them to Bulgaria. Especially after Germany kind of... <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually a good example, too. After why we keep talking about Bulgaria and why Bulgaria keeps coming up a lot... Austria, after the uh, invasion, of, well, not invasion, but absorption of Austria into Nazi Germany, Austria basically gave Bulgaria all their arms, with a very few minor exceptions, but almost all of the M95s and all of the spares and everything like that went to Bulgaria. Because Bulgaria was still using them, they were still producing the ammo, so that's why you still see a lot of these with Bulgarian markings, because that's where they, most of them ended up. They bought... Bulgaria bought Czechoslovakia's, they bought Poland's, they bought Italy's, they bought anybody that would have extras, they bought them. So almost, almost all of them go back to Bulgaria. So speaking of Bulgaria, I don't know if you know this, but the Balkans aren't exactly peaceful area most of the time. <laughs> yeah. I think there's been one or two conflicts there. A couple of them. Bulgaria probably started up a couple times, but... <laughs> <laughs> There's one example I have of what happens to an M95 once it, right there, yeah, that one, once it ends up in a different country in the Balkans. So this is an M95-24. Now, this, most people know them as the M95-M, which is more common. The M95-24 is the earlier version of it. I don't know why they made the change. I know that the slash 24 means that it's basically taking this rifle and changing it to the VZ24 style. It uses a VZ24 sight, front and rear, and I believe it uses a VZ24 barrel as well. And they converted this to, instead of being uh, in-block loaded, but stripper clip loaded, they have a stripper clip uh, hole here, and instead of uh, the regular monolifter magazine, they took up a clip and welded it in place, and you just strip it strip of rounds off in there and this is eight millimeter mauser not eight by 56r yeah and this was yugoslavia and it's and it they made it a uh, it's a short rifle length so uh the difference in length here we can kind of try to that, show yeah. you oh boy <laughs> <laughs> there we go so uh so we can see with the the butt stocks uh starting at the same point that it's about, the, about four inches yeah so the 95 24 it is an actual short rifle length where regular M95s are gonna be typically this, this sort of carbine length. I've not shot this one yet. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's pretty sweet. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting gun. So like looking at the, the, uh, the, the rear sight and everything of it, it looks just like a Mauser, pretty much. It's a, it's yeah. a Mauser rear sight, it's a Mauser they front even, sight. They even changed the handguard to match more of the Mauser style. Mm -hmm. You notice it comes over completely over the barrel. It's, it's very much trying to make a Monlicker M95 into a Mauser. Yeah. As much as they could. Yeah, yeah, about as much as it could. So this is gonna be a very rare version. The, the more common gun that's a lot like this that people are probably gonna run into or see for sale is the, uh, is it the M95M, right? Yes, which the M stands for? <laughs> Monlicker. Yes. So, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, and it's weird because it doesn't really use a Monlicker magazine, no. right? But the, only, they, the only thing is it has the extended magazine. So it's a these. Model 1895 Monlicker, but it's an 8mm Mauser and doesn't use Monlicker like, in-block clips anymore. Don't it ask is, me, man. It's I weird. I, I That's a really weird... <laughs> I don't know why they changed it. I don't know when they changed it, but I do know they changed it. Yeah. So the thing with those, the M95Ms, uh, and maybe a little bit for, for these two, but uh, you want to make sure if you're going to look for an M95M that it has the original uh, clip that goes inside of it. So the, the way it works, it needs the clip, and it's not just a standard M95 clip that's just like inside of it. No. It's a specialty-made clip, and you could, if, if yours doesn't have it, you can kind of, 
using an M95 clip. And... I've seen people that use regular M95 clips, and if you're handy enough, you can make it work. Uh, the original clips, very, very beginning for Yugoslavia was, uh, was the M95 clips, actually. But then they started making specialty clips for it, which was easier to insert. Um, so you can, it can be done. I won't say it's impossible. You just need to be handy with what you're doing. Yeah. So if you come across an, M95, an M95M for sale, you want to make sure that it has the original clip inside of it. Mm -hmm. Because if it doesn't have that clip, it's basically a single shot. And not even a good single shot because it's probably going to end up breaking the extractor. Yes. And that's which is the other thing that you want to look for with M95Ms is the, the extractor. Actually, with all M95s. I should say that with all M95s, the, the magazine system, including the M95Ms and M9524s, are positive feed only. That means it has to feed out of the magazine for it to fire. Single loading forces the extractor to lip up over the rim. With rim ammunition, that's a nightmare because it's forcing the extractor way out of where it needs yeah, to be. Yeah, it's a huge distance. With, yeah. with, with the 8mm Mauser, it's not as much, but it's still forcing the extractor to do something it's not meant to do. So you're putting f fractures, stress fractures, every time you do that and eventually they will break. And it's not uncommon to find M95s with broken extractors. Yeah, especially on the M95Ms, because it seems like yes. a lot of people single load those a lot more. Yes, um, more uh, often. it will yeah. happen a lot more with those because the clips tended to fall out and just get lost over time. Uh, and also people tend to think that without using rimmed ammunition, it's not a big of a deal. And it's essentially a Mauser, so. Yeah, why, not? why not? Yeah, and, and then it breaks, and yeah, and then you then you're looking for an M95M extractor to go with a clip, which is going to be next to impossible to find uh, an actual M95 clip or extractor. So, well, I mean, an M95M extractor or clip are nearly impossible. M95 extractors are somewhat available, but not super common anymore either. Yeah, yeah. So, like I've seen M95Ms for sale without the clip. And I just don't even, if it doesn't have a clip, it's like not a real gun in my mind. It's, like, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a wall hanger. I mean, it's a yeah. nice piece most of the time if you're wanting a collector, a collector that wants to have one and is an example. I would even, I think I just hit the mic. I would even say that I would consider buying one without the clip, but. Maybe just to have like an as example. To have it as, as a placeholder hanger. until I found the yeah. next one. So, because a lot of people call those like single shots, which. They technically yeah, are. It'll happen. It'll work a few times, but uh, I mean, you yeah. can put a different ammo in different guns, and it'll work a couple times. Yeah. that's how it works, right? Yeah. So the so there's there's a lot of variations to get, and just like the average person looking at buying one of these or looking at these, they're all going to look the same. You know, yes. a lot of people don't necessarily even know that all these variations exist. No, which is kind of a neat thing because it's not highly sought after so oh, you can no. find good deals on these guns average cost of these was under three hundred dollars yeah yeah i think I with paid... the exception being my long rifle oh yeah and yeah. and this one the m95 24 yeah so i think i paid like 250 for mine a couple years ago so you can find good deals but like lately every m95 that i've seen has been like around the four to five range which i think is too high i don't know exactly what they sell for i'm thinking it's like Around I see, three. I see them more often between the 250 to 350 range. I think that's the more that's the more realistic price for them. The big issue is going to be that they're the PPU uh, uh, out of Serbia is the only manufacturer yes, of ammunition. Yes. Yeah, that's even... going to be your biggest problem, um, and the ammunition's mm -hmm. not cheap. Yeah, I was know. I was going to say yeah. So as as far as shooters go, you can reload for them. Um, and you actually know, why I started reloading was for my M95. Yeah, you kind of have to. If you want to shoot them, you're going to have to reload. They're very expensive. And it's pretty crazy because actual World War II produced German ammo, 8x56R, mm -hmm. for is Bulgaria. cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, that's, that Nazi-made ammo is cheaper than modern commercial 8x56R. And it will kick the shit out of you. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's pretty crazy. So I have a bunch of 56R now. And it's all German World War II produced stuff. And the, typically it's actually in really good condition. It's actually, yeah. I've never seen mm -hmm. anybody complain about hang fires or any corrosion issues. Most mm -hmm. of the time it's in great shape. And importantly, it comes with clips. Yes, yeah, it comes with clips. And that have Waffen amps on them. So it's, it's pretty interesting that that stuff but is... But they're not just, reloadable. Yeah, yeah, primed. yeah, Bur yeah Burdan primed. Um, so not reloadable, but it's still like the cheapest ammo to shoot. So It is, but it is, I would... Um, 
the stoutness of the recoil would probably get most of its reputation from one of those. Yeah, yeah. So it's a difference, I will say. Yeah. Between PPU and the uh, the German manufacturer, it's a big difference. Yeah, and the ammo is getting pretty collectible. So I'm not advocating for shooting like historical World War II ammunition, but it just happens to be the cheapest right now. So um, I forgot how much I paid for mine. I found like a bulk deal on Gunbroker, mm -hmm. and I paid like. 25 cents around or something like that. It's not for, surprising to me. Yeah, it, it's you know not like the same thing with the rifles. The ammo is not super sought after. So you can get good deals out there. The mm. deals exist. So we hope this video wasn't too rambly. <laughs> this been a good, I swear we thought this video was going to be like 10 minutes. Well, I love talking like about m 95 Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's a lot to cover with them and there's a lot of different And then there's even more stuff I could get into. We could get into Italian capture rifles, which have different markings. We could get into... Um, uh, Polish issue rifles, we could get into Spanish Civil War rifles, uh, we can get yeah. into German issue rifles, which actually, I will say this as a PSA, the German issue rifles get faked a lot. Yeah. Uh, they yeah. get a WA stamp put on, uh, was that, that is a Waffen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. WA is for manufacturer, correct? I believe it's, it's WA and then HA. Inspector and manufacturer, depending. Okay. All I know is is that the WA stamp is the fake. The HA stamp is the correct stamp to have. For, for N95s. Yes. Those, I've been told, are the rebuild stamps. And those are the only ones that will appear, and they'll only be on the stocks. Okay. I've seen them all over the guns. I've seen them on the barrels. I've seen them on the receivers. I've seen them on the stocks. And they're all fake. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like I've seen quite a few little Waffenomp stamps for sale, and it just seems like more and more people are going to be buying those stamps, you know, and and you know, stamping guns to try to fake, fake German stuff. So that's it's becoming a lot more prevalent, and it's interesting that even in like M95, it's a very niche up. collector's market, and there's still fakes for yeah. German stuff. Which maybe people think you know you can get them pretty cheap, so then they're going to put a couple stamps on them, and then you know, right, and double you can their sell money, them yeah. as you know rare SS model ones, but oh, I, will, yeah. I will say that the SS did not use them. It was only uh, gendarmerie. That's French. Yeah. <laughs> what is that version? Uh, Volkstrom. Oh, the Volkstrom. Volkstrom. Yeah. Okay. They were yeah. the only ones issued M95s, and they were issued M95 30s, probably from Czechoslovakia or Bulgaria or Austria, who knows? They yeah, yeah. The Volkstrom got, 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 they got, the Volkstrom had M95s, like Dutch M95s. Yes. So like they, they use any and everything they could get their hands on pretty much. Yeah, so it's, there are period photos of M95s, Steyr, Monlicker M95s by Nazi Germany, but finding exact proof of one is hard. Yeah, yeah. I've seen pictures, yeah, of German soldiers with M95s. But a lot of times, the German used guns didn't get any stamps or anything no. on them. Especially so no ones way. for the Volkstrom, because why bother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say M95s never got any stamps. Well, they um, weren't, they, unless they were rebuilt. By, by the source that I have, um, which is a mutual friend of ours, uh, who has read the books that are in German, the only ones that would have been stamped if they were reworked at some, at some arsenals. And, but they never were produced, so therefore they were never inspected. They would have already been inspected by the previous proof marks that are on them, and they would have just been issued to the volunteer units or whatever as guard as guard duty or prison camps. So, the the M ninety five rabbit hole. It's fun. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's interesting, and it's one of those guns. You know, you wouldn't necessarily think that there's so much variation and so much history behind it, but just a rather you know unassuming gun has got a pretty. Pretty deep history and a lot of variants. There's just a lot of variants to these guns. And so, uh, if, you know, I'd suggest if you're thinking about getting one of these, like with all mill serps, the sooner you get into it, the better because, you know, prices only go up mm -hmm. on these. So, I bought my first one for $199. Jeez. And yeah. uh, this last one, which was this one, the M9524, this was five. Now, that's probably a pretty good price on this, considering yeah, the condition say, of it. Yeah, I would say that's five is very, very good. But, uh, and, and they're not going to be very common. Some of these, some of these oddball variations are not going to be yeah, very common. Yeah, the Czechoslovakian receivers are only 5,000, and they yeah. went to Bulgaria after Czechoslovakia yeah. um, was uh, switched over to the Mauser-style rifles. Bulgaria used them up until the 70s, so the turnover rate's pretty high there. 
Uh, Bulgarian contract rifles with the crest, those are going to be pretty sought after because there, there was only a 50, 75,000 of those made, long rifles and short rifles. Um, so those are going to be two of their more popular straight up M95 variants or as far as rarity goes. And then you have the M95 24s, you have the M95 Ms. As a variant goes, that's going to be higher up on the rarity scale. Um, H code M95s from Hung Hungary, um, that kind of thing. But as it stands, it's the reason I just really love these guns. But I will say one more thing. Uh, I forgot to mention this before, and you can edit this in if you want. Uh, edit it out if you want. But there are only three types of wood stocks. Okay, for only three types of wood stocks. Let me guess: beech. Beech is one. Elm. Elm is the other. Uh, walnut? Correct. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, which one was first? Uh, beach. No, walnut. Oh, dang it. Walnut is the standard stock of Austria-Hungary. Uh, that was the, well, that's walnut on that 1886. It's walnut on the, most of the M95s. During World War I, they ran out of walnut. Elm was substituted. Elm is a lot softer, a lot softer wood, and doesn't hold up as well. A lot of the elm stocks you're going to run across are going to be beat to crap. You have an elm stock one right here? Right here and right here. Okay. So, walnut? Yes. You can and tell by the tight grain pattern. Yeah, and yeah. The, and the overall honey color. Yeah, yeah. And then, here we have elm. Elm, I've seen in different colors, but the big thing you need to look for is the large grain. The large, it looks like big black lines through the whole gun. And beach is probably beach is the, very easy. Yeah, this is the it's easiest blonde. beach to tell. Yeah, uh, and it's got to have it's going to have very tight grain, and it's going to be whenever they cut it, you'll see along the edges, you'll see like these weird circles where the grain has been polished down, and you'll just see these weird uh, indentations. But beach is very easy. Just just the yeah, blonde. it's very it's very blonde. Yeah, it's yellow yellowish. No, yeah, no, that's a lot. We covered a lot. I wonder if you're still if you're watching still listening. this. Dang, first off, <laughs> and second, thank you. Um, yeah, this is uh, so this is a my doozy. favorite thing to talk about. Most yeah, you don't want to talk to me about yeah. it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. So uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, we're gonna get back to the podcast pretty soon. Yeah. yeah. So uh, everybody asks about why you know why we uh, the podcast have sort of stopped mm, for a couple mm. of months. And the uh, last one was in July, I think. Wow, that is that's 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 quite a few months. We still get quite a few views though on this on the, mm -hmm. on the ones that we have up. Which uh, thank you guys for continuing to. Yeah, listen. it's cool. We want to keep doing those. We're planning on keeping doing those. We do have a couple backlogged uh, for that have already been recorded that we need to edit. Yes. Um, unfortunately. And it is an unbelievable amount of time. It is. But unfortunately, my wife had a baby in August, and uh, that's been the biggest concern in my life right yeah, now. Your second. Second kid. Second kid, yes. Yes. Two. So, yeah, double double trouble. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll get back to it soon, hopefully. I'm um, hoping in the next month or two I'll be able to get the ones that we have on backlog edited and uploaded and then we can get to recording again. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Sometime I'm going to talk to you about the Russian semi-automatic variant of the M95. Get out of here. Uh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs>